we are nearing the end of our day and I'm going to briefly introduce the uh, member of our NSET committee, Antti Mackinnon, and he has been a part of NSET, which has been the, the federal group of uh, leaders that helped to craft the NNI for seven years. And I've gotten to work with him closely over the last year and a half in the NNCO. I just wanna say, I'm so glad that we ended on the commercialization panel and we again ended on workforce because it keeps coming up over and over again, how important the skills and the expertise of the people in our community are. And so I just wanted to share that briefly before I welcome Antti to the stage to introduce our last keynote speaker of the day, which anyone in this audience and everybody who's still a little bit of a kid at heart has got to be excited to hear from. So with that, Antti, I'm going to turn it over to you. Thank you. Okay, Quinn, thank you very much for the um, intro. And it is indeed my great pleasure to introduce our final keynote speaker of the um, otherwise fantastic day. And uh, I am excited about the next talk as well. Uh, so uh, Dr. Kathleen uh, Rubens was selected to the 2009 astronaut class after completing a PhD at Stanford Medical um, School and carrying out uh, um, research work at MIT. Then in 2016, um, she and her crew, in fact, flew the mission, carrying out close to 300 experiments on board of the, uh, the station. Most notably, um, she performed the first ever DNA sequencing in space. Uh, following that, uh, in 2020, she was back in the space as a flight engineer. And uh, in total, with these two missions, including four spacewalks, she spent about 300 days in space. While back on here on Earth, um, she's um, carrying out uh, design and engineering work uh, supporting the next generation uh, spacesuit development. That's not enough for her. She's also recently uh, joined the uh, Army um, Reserves as an innovation officer which allows her to carry on with her biomedical research. So that as an introduction, um, I wanna invite you to welcome Dr. Rubens as our next keynote speaker. Hi everybody. I'm so excited to be here. This is, uh, this is the end of a really long, informative and super exciting day. Um, so hopefully I'm going to be a little entertaining. I'm going to show you pictures of space. Everybody likes to look at pictures of space. So I'm going to talk about nanotechnology and space, some experiments that we have done, as well as a lot of needs that are coming up for NASA as we transition from low Earth orbit to the moon to Mars. But first, I want to start with a story. So this story starts with Kate sitting on top of the rocket, thinking about all of the bad decisions I have made in my life <laughs> that have gotten me to this point. It's cramped inside the Soyuz. Uh, it's, it's, not a, it's not a comfortable place to be on top of a rocket thinking about what's gonna happen. However, an even scarier place to be is underneath the rocket. Six months before. So I was the backup crew uh, and we go out to the prime cruise launch and as the backup crew, you get a chance to stand under this rocket as it's being slowly lifted into position. It's creaking and groaning and wheezing. And you're standing there thinking, this is 688,000 pounds of metal and fuel right over my head. I had asked earlier, why isn't the prime crew coming with us? And was told, too dangerous. But it's okay for the backup crew. We're not flying in space yet. It causes you to think quite a bit when you are being propelled from zero to 17,500 miles per hour, why I'm doing this. And the reason is really the International Space Station and the research that we can do there. The ISS is a phenomenal structure. It is the biggest structure humans have built uh, off the earth. 
Um, this is the this is the work of nations on on Earth. Twenty years have been collaborating to put this space station together. We were building it for a long time, and now we're really using it at its full potential to carry out microgravity research. Research in microgravity is incredibly fascinating because you can study things using gravity as a variable. Most of our experiments on Earth, you're not able to do that. Um, I, I go out and I talk to people a lot and I say, well, where's the zero G room at NASA? If we had that, we wouldn't need a space program. Um, so we, we can use the properties of microgravity to investigate everything from phys physics experiments to material science, to molecular biology, and even now working on producing materials. I wanna talk about a few use cases for nanotechnology and space exploration. So the first one is DNA sequencing in space. Um, so we, we mentioned we carried out the first DNA sequencing uh, in space, and that was using nanopore technology. So I'll tell you a little bit about that. Also wanna talk about water purification, sustainability, recycling, and sensing. And then human health monitoring in space and how nanotechnology and sensors might help us out with that. So why do DNA or RNA sequencing in space? We, what was our motivation for all of this? Uh, first is because we're scientists and engineers and we wanna see if the thing's gonna work. But most importantly, we were really interested in using it for microbial and environmental sensing. So right now on the International Space Station, if, if you needed to take a sample, you would take a, a swab and put it on a bacterial plate and you would time that right when we're gonna have a vehicle leaving the space station that's gonna land back on Earth. We don't have a full clinical lab on the International Space Station. So you have to wait maybe three months before a vehicle is gonna depart. Take your swab, take your sequence, streak it on plates. It's gonna go back down in a Soyuz and land in Kazakhstan where then a team of NASA meets them with an airplane and flies these plates back to a lab at Johnson Space Center to do clinical microbiology. So this three month lag time is not very helpful when you're trying to diagnose a clinical illness or you have a massive environmental problem on the space station. And we don't have the laboratory capabilities to do clinical microbiology on board, but we thought we could certainly probably do DNA and RNA sequencing. We're also into, interested in this technology just as a technology to do baseline understanding of the physiologic changes that happen to humans in space. We wanna be able to monitor human health and disease in real time. Again, in this kind of resource poor environment where we have no access to the sorts of labs that you would find in a clinic or a hospital. Eventually, we're gonna be increasing our earth independence in these future moon, moon to Mars missions. We're not gonna have the opportunity to send things back on earth. And finally, when we're thinking about astrobiology, there's possibilities to use sequencing methods to look at non-canonical bases or perhaps base structures that we would not even expect to find on Earth. So the, the, really the primary driver was this swab to sequence idea. You know, could we take a swab and could we identify it in near real time on the International Space Station? We had a lot of challenges trying to figure out how to do this. So the first one was power, mass, and volume. And this is the trifecta of everything that NASA worries about when you need to send an experiment into space. Uh, what's the footprint of this? It's very expensive to lift mass off the earth. It's very difficult to get something that's more than a very small compact footprint into a spacecraft. And all of our power is generated by solar arrays. So the power that powers our life support system also powers all of the scientific research on the space station. We also have to think about fluids handling in microgravity. How are we gonna deal with liquids there? The laboratory setup was definitely a challenge and limited additional supporting equipment to help us evolve our experiment or to troubleshoot when things were going wrong. So first the power mass and volume. Uh, and really the only reason that we were able to conceive of this experiment and carry it out was because of nanotechnology. So previous sequencers uh, like the one you see on the right uh, involved a lot of uh, chemiluminescent or fluorescent reporters, a pretty large benchtop type machine uh, and very delicate CCD cameras or lasers, you know, things that would be difficult to bring to space and even more difficult uh, for the astronaut to set up and troubleshoot and uh, be the tech support on. And this just wouldn't be feasible to put in a spacecraft and, and the power draw would not be acceptable. So with the evolution of uh, nanopore sequencing in 2010, 
we really looked at this and thought, this is the kind of thing we need for space exploration. It's small, it's self-contained, about you know, half the width of your cell phone, you can put it in your pocket. So just briefly to tell you about nanopore sequencing, probably most people in the audience uh, are extremely familiar with this, but essentially you're gonna have, um, you're gonna have a, an array of nanopores in their own individual wells and a motor protein, which is gonna take that strand of DNA or RNA and the motor protein is gonna ratchet that strand down through the nanopore, which is uh, in, an, in an ionic mixture. And so you can sense the electrical changes at a, a given base pair it's passing through this nanopore and the motor proteins there to essentially slow down the ratcheting because the speed at which the DNA is going to pass through is far too quickly to really resolve at the single base pair level. And so a lot of work has gone into this over the years. You know, this has been theorized for decades um, and really put into a device uh, in, in 2010. And so we wanted to see if this was going to work on the International Space Station because of the form factor, the size, um, the power drop. The next challenge is the fluids in microgravity. And so this is my good friend, uh, Chris Hatfield, who's most famous for doing cover songs uh, on the International Space Station and putting videos out to YouTube. Go look it up. It's phenomenal. Um, but he's modeling here one of the properties of fluids in space, which is that if you take some water from your drink bag and squeeze it out and detach it, it's just going to form a sphere uh, and it's going to sit there. It's, it's really interesting for some fluids uh, experiments where you want to look at containerless vessels. You want to have things that don't have any interference um, of the container surrounding them. That's if you get the water to behave uh, freely. However, most times the, the liquid's coming in contact with some kind of surface. And so when you don't have gravity, the forces of adhesion you know, and surface tension are really taking over. And so a lot of times scientists will be thinking about what, what are things like on the space station? The water's floating everywhere and it's really not is sticking to everything. That's the problem, is the water, it, it, it just wants to be on whatever surface until you give it something a little bit more hydrophilic and then it really wants to be there as well. And so we didn't know how all of this was gonna work uh, in terms of the molecular biology, uh, which my, my mom visited me once in my grad school lab and said, well, molecular biology just appears to be scientists moving small amounts of water around from tube to tube. Now that was accurate characterization. Um, but, but so much of biology depends on microliter amounts of fluid and interactions with, uh, with containers and with plastic that are very different from what we're experiencing on Earth could be a, a serious challenge. The next thing was the laboratory setup. So we do not have a, a beautiful university research lab. There were many times that I missed my lab at MIT when I was up in space. Um, what I generally term it is uh, MacGyvering science. We have what we have up there. We're probably not getting anything else for another three months and we need to make it work. Um, and we have limited additional equipment to do these kinds of things. So on my first flight, I, had, I was really asking about, you know, how do we do molecular biology in space? What's the lab setup? What are the tools? And I got to NASA and I was told, you know, well, we built this very fancy shoebox size device that fits in a mid-deck locker on the shuttle and and you build this device and certify it and you push the button and the experiment happens um, but this device can take 10 or 12 years to build and certify and i don't know very many grad students that would like to spend 12 years doing their phd this is a challenge for funding cycles um, so I, I had just asked some questions and i was told you know kate you're new here you're a baby astronaut you obviously don't know very much you can't pipette in space this made me mad. Number one, I was being called a baby astronaut, but number two, like my question was why? So uh, this was a very unofficial experiment at this point. Uh, as astronauts were allowed some psych support on our space missions, we get five kilograms of psych support. Uh, usually people use it for like cookies or a letter from home or a stuffed animal from their kid. I got together with my mission psychologist and had a conversation at the end of which he agreed, you're a scientist, pipetting makes you happy. <laughs> Therefore, this is definitely psych support equipment and I packed my five kilograms accordingly. So what this allowed me to do was with some very simple materials and, and pipettes, um, duct tape and Velcro, 
to make a lab bench like we would see on the ground. And I just wanted to see where it was going to break down. Why did pipetting not work in space? It's air displacement. You've got filter tips on it. I could not figure out what the problem was going to be. And so I wanted to see the interaction of these fluids with different plastics, um, how they would be contained. And what we really found was that obviously the, the smaller the container, the more contained it is, there's more surface area. And as long as you filled the well just about one third full, it would make this meniscus and crawl up the sides, but it wouldn't interfere with the other wells. It's not flying out of the container. Uh, I could even get up to a 50 mil conical doing this. The next thing that we really had to think about was this lack of other materials. We didn't have a centrifuge on board that could spin down 1.5 mil Eppendorf tubes, but we had a 3D printer and we had a drill. And you get very inventive in space. So all of these things come together to come up with this, you know, very hard scrabble MacGyver type lab. And this allowed us to perform our first sequencing reaction in space. Um, and this was the moment I would say, beside maybe climbing on top of a rocket, that I was the most terrified in my life because I had to do one stroke of a pipette. But this one stroke of a pipette was a DNA sequencing library that contained a mixture of mouse, E. coli, and lambda phage material that we had prepped on Earth and sent up uh, on board the space station, essentially to figure out what was going to go wrong with the sequencing reaction. Um, and I was doing this experiment, right? But there are hundreds of people watching on the ground with bated breath for me to do my, my one pipette. I really didn't want to screw this up. So I also smuggled up a flow cell so I could practice with, with water in the interim so I didn't mess up my big moment. Um, and we really were not convinced that this was gonna work. However, it did. It worked the first time. Um, it actually works a little bit better than on Earth. I don't know when in my scientific career the experiment has ever worked the first time, but thank goodness it was the big one on the International Space Station. So we sequenced over 2 billion base pairs uh, during that mission of this, these cDNA libraries that we had prepped on Earth. Uh, we published this uh, back in 2017. And so we decided to make this mixture of the, the mammalian and the microbial genomes so we could have a, a, a mixture of complex CG content, different species, uh, make it a little difficult by putting all this information together and then seeing if we could demultiplex it at the end, just using the sequence data, and then reassemble those genomes from our in-space sequencing data. Uh, as it turned out, that worked really well. We got um, excellent reassembly of all of these genomes and demonstrated that we could do this reproducibly uh, and in a really consistent manner on board the space station. Since then, that you know, this has kicked off kind of a revolution. We've got these tools, we've got this crazy lab bench, everybody's into pipetting at NASA because I sent them that video no words in the email. I just sent the video down. Now, all of a sudden, this is in payloads all over because you can pipette in space. So we did the first cDNA sequencing. Um, we did the first direct RNA sequencing. And, and what the nanotechnology allows you to do is directly read off of the RNA molecules. And so most sequencing technologies will take that RNA, they'll reverse transcribe it and convert it into cDNA, and then you're reading that. Um, this is putting it through another step, and there's, there's possibility for error introduction here. So because we're directly reading base pair by base pair, we can sequence that RNA as well. And we can directly sequence DNA. Uh, we now have capabilities to sequence epigenetic modifications of DNA and whole genomes and all kinds of things. Um, so we, we published that. And then to our original aim, uh, instead of sequencing pre-prepared libraries, we wanted to take a swab directly from the space station. We cultured it on the space station to isolate specific bacteria so we knew what we were putting in there, sequenced it, and then returned that same plate in a spaceship headed for Kazakhstan so that we could verify clinically, microbially, that that's what we had on board. Of course, this, this worked very well. Then we wanted to do culture independent profiling. So when you take bacteria and you put it on a culture plate, most bacteria actually really don't do very well in human cell, in cell culture performed by humans. They like their specific environments. We have a hard time growing a lot of bacteria. And so if you do a culture independent method, you're getting a really good look at exactly what's in the microbiome of that particular environment. And so we wanted to do this for surfaces and for water. Then we wanted to start looking at other tools. Uh, so we did a cellular transformation, a CRISPR-Cas9 transformation 
um, to do genome editing and then use the sequencing to detect it. And, and there's a lot more experiments coming up that I don't have time to get into. And so this, this, this nanotechnology, this very small platform has launched an entire area of research on the International Space Station. The next thing that you know, nanotechnology could be super interesting where we haven't done as much research is water purification, the sustainability, recycling, and sensing of microbial or chem chemical contaminants in our water system. And so you can see on the right there, um, those are water recycling racks. Um, so they're huge closet sized pieces of equipment on the International Space Station that have helped us achieve a 97% closed loop efficiency. So we very rarely ship water up from the earth. We only have a 3% loss, which essentially means that today's coffee is tomorrow's coffee, is tomorrow's coffee. And it's not your coffee, it's your crewmate's coffee all combined together. It tastes fine. But what you have with this very, very closed loop is it's the same water. Um, and so we have to carefully monitor the purification of this water. This is, could be a huge human health problem. Uh, if we get contaminants in there, this could be affecting other spacecraft systems. And so one of the things that we've been thinking a lot about is um, could we do water purification in smaller systems? Could we have backup systems? Could we have, uh, you know, aquaporin filtration was tested on the space station. Um, but can we can we also maybe reduce those giant closet size racks down to something smaller? Uh, we've been thinking about nanoparticle based fibers for disinfectant, um, portable water disinfectants, again, so that we could have uh, water in each module, maybe systems that aren't completely interconnected with each other. We're very interested in non chemical biocides. Uh, right now, we use silver on the Russian segment and iodine on the US, Japan, uh, Canadian and European segment. Uh, and so the, these biocides have been around forever. They're quite effective, um, but, but there are issues with these biocides and non-chemical biocides would be of great interest for us. And then also coatings for the water recycling system for the pipes and for the equipments that, that are having this very long dwell time of the same source continuously recycled of this water. So the sensors are of great interest because we've got this wastewater tank um, we have minimal microbial control. We've got iodine, which we then filter out before we're drinking. And we really don't regularly sample for species identification. We'll take a water sample uh, and we'll look at total inorganic carbon and total organic carbon to see if we have, if there's a lot, there's a lot of carbon sources in there, maybe we've got to think about a, a problem. Something's probably growing, uh, but we're not actually identifying what that species is. And we don't even have the opportunity to identify it before the, the sequencing until we sent it back down to the earth. So one thing we've been working really hard on is some metagenomic methods to monitor spacecraft water systems, the health and status of those uh, contamination, any issues that we might have with something growing. But other in situ sensors could provide health and status of this water system without needing to do uh, all of this DNA sequencing. And so this is of great interest because as we move further and further from earth, we're just gonna lose that ability to send things back to our home planet. So we need small portable water filtration systems that also can self-monitor, uh, potentially self-correct with, with types of disinfection and keep the status of this, of this system healthy and safe for up to two and a half years for a Mars voyage with no new equipment and no other intervention. I think you guys are up to that task. I feel like this is the right audience to solve that problem for us. Another thing is the human health monitoring in space. Um, and so uh, the astronauts undergo a lot of physiological changes when we get up there. And it's actually quite amazing that the human body can even survive in microgravity, given that this is an environment that we have had no contact with before the 20th century. We have not evolved in microgravity whatsoever. And so we're learning more and more about the different uh, effects this has on body systems. So certainly neurovestibular is severely perturbed. Uh, when you get up there right away, um, Scott Kelly said, you feel like you've been put in a barrel, lit on fire and kicked over Niagara Falls. And that's pretty, pretty accurate of what's going on in your brain and your nerve vestibular system. And this calms down after a few weeks, but then it's a problem again, coming back to gravity. Um, we've got a lot of cardiovascular issues. The heart actually is a slightly different shape. Uh, it becomes a little bit more spherical. 
on, on Earth, uh, we have this, this great gravity that's drawing all of our blood down to our legs. And so our human uh, anatomy has evolved a system to be pumping that back up against the gravity vector. All of a sudden we get in space, we don't need that anymore. And so our bodies are still pumping things up, but we've got this, this effect of a fluid shift upward. So you get in space, um, and your heart senses, gosh, I've got all this fluid. I better get rid of it. And you, you diaries like crazy for a couple of days. And then you settle into your new homeostasis, which is a lot less water. You have, you have smaller plasma volume when you're in space, um, but you, you have this fluid shift. And so we're recognizing that this fluid shift actually can cause a lot of issues um, with the cardiovascular system. Another thing is that we've got arterial stiffness and most recently and terrifying, um, is that we've started to find evidence of uh, thrombi, of clots in astronauts. This is completely by happenstance. We were ultrasounding somebody for a scientific experiment, and the scientists noticed uh, a giant clot. And this has led us to a series of experiments where we identified um, stagnant or even reverse jugular blood flow. Uh, it's got a lot of implications for glial flushing and CNS as well. A uh, bone deteriorates pretty rapidly in space. An astronaut will lose in one month what an 80-year-old osteoporotic woman would lose in one year until we came to our countermeasure of resistive exercise. That helps the muscle as well, but this is also rapidly degrading. Um, the immune system has a, a fair amount of degradation that happens in space, and we get things like reactivation of herpes viruses and, and EBV in astronauts. We've had cases of shingles on board. Um, nutrition is an issue to shelf stabilize uh, all of our, our nutritional needs and to have this be available for up to three years in a shelf stable format. Behavior, right? You're sticking six people in a tin can together for a long period of time. It tends not to be the astronauts that have a problem with each other. It tends to be the astronauts getting kind of mad at ground control for telling us to do stupid stuff all day. We got to work on this behavior and, and this group living and a sense of kumbaya, particularly as we get farther and farther uh, from Earth. My question is, how long is it going to take before the first mission to Mars and the first colonists start to re rebel? So think about that. Come talk to me at the break. I have my suspicions. Uh, radiation is, is also a huge issue. It's an issue in low Earth orbit, but it's really going to be increasingly an issue as we go to the moon deal with Van Allen belts, and particularly as we go to these long missions to Mars, uh, radiation is, is increasingly uh, becoming one of our big threats. So we need ways to monitor all of this. Uh, we need ways to monitor the physiology. There's a lot of nanotechnology applications. Hopefully you're thinking about the ways your nanotechnology could meet some of those monitoring needs. And then we also have needs for things like advanced habitats, uh, lightweight construction materials. Again, Mass power volume are our enemies when we're talking about space exploration. So anything that we can do to get lighter structures, um, to get structures that you could maybe launch individually and then assemble on orbit, because it's a lot easier to launch small pieces over multiple launches than to get one giant thing up there. Um, spacesuit materials, um, you know, as it was mentioned, I am working on uh, advanced lunar spacesuit design, and this is a super interesting problem. Uh, we need to be able to contain the human uh, in, in absolute vacuum. And so we have to keep the human at a pressure between 4.3 and 8.2 PSI for extended durations, which is kind of like being inside a basketball, yet they have to be mobile enough to walk around and take the geology samples on the lunar surface. This suit is going to have to be radiation resistant. Um, we've got incredible thermal challenges. We're going to go into permanently shadowed craters on the moon. Um, these craters can get down to less than 110 Kelvin. We have not sent humans uh, really into that environment for an extended period of time out in vacuum to do this kind of sampling. So we're going to need some new materials. Uh, we have a huge problem with dust on the lunar surface. The lunar surface, the lunar regolith that we're just going to be tromping around in this sandbox and kicking up dust, which has got strange electrostatic properties and sticks to you everywhere, it's essentially pulverized glass. So we're walking around in shards of glass that's sticking on our suit. And it's a huge human health concern when you bring it back inside the vehicle. It's also a problem for anything where you've got joints and bearings and parts that like to move. Uh, this is really not very compatible with this lunar dust. We need to think about in situ resource utilization. So we're moving into an area in space exploration where we're bringing less and less with us from Earth. It's getting more and more complicated. We're going farther away. 
So we need to figure out what are we going to do with the materials that we have there. We're going to have lunar regolith. Um, hopefully, we are going to go to the moon and find uh, water. We know that there's water ice on the lunar surface. It's an open question. How big are these chunks? Is this just molecular water that's distributed throughout the regolith and it's going to be very difficult to purify? Or is this, you know, large deposits of frost that are close to the surface? How deep is it? And what's the quantity? When we start to answer those questions, we're going to get a handle on what do we have to work with on the lunar surface. You got a lot of things. You got either sunlight or you've got uh, shade, permanently shaded uh, for thermal rejection. You've got vacuum. Uh, you've got this lunar regolith that you can transform into other things. Uh, water is amazing for us. Humans can drink it. You can split it. You can make fuel. Uh, you can use it for all kinds of things. Um, we really are concerned about flammability. Our, our initial idea when we went to the moon is, you know, we're going to have these spacesuits at 4.3 PSI. We need to get them low enough that the human can move around, but not so low that we cause decompression sickness when they exit the capsule. So we had planned on this for about 10 years. Uh, this was going to, we're going to do this really high oxygen, low pressure uh, environment. We're going to be at, at you know, 8.6 PSI um, and the high 30s for the oxygen content until we started doing testing of the materials. And we thought, you know, Apollo did it. They did 100% O2. We've got our catalog of materials. This is going to be fine. Well, when Apollo did the testing, they did not have the high speed cameras that we have today. So we start doing this materials flammability testing. We're able to capture uh, immediate ignition effects. So, you know, all the fuzz is kind of burning off these materials. We're able to see that now. This is something that once you see it, you cannot unsee it. So all of the materials that we thought were going to be just fine are starting to fail our flammability test, which is causing us to rethink our atmosphere. This is a huge issue. Uh, you know, we can play around with increasing the pressure in the suit, which makes it really hard for the human to move. Uh, it was suggested that maybe we just decrease the oxygen content and the astronauts can be a little hypoxic. That got shot down very quickly. This is not an environment where you want to be a little bit loopy. Um, you know, or you could have an extended oxygen pre-breathe, which cuts into your time to do this incredibly valuable scientific work on the lunar surface. Um, so this is a this is a big thing. If we can get that materials flammability solved, uh, this this issue is not solved. I work every day on an elevated suit pressure testing to try to figure out how high can we bring that suit pressure and still move around. Um, we need long wear clothing. Right now on the ISS, we put on our clothes and we wear them for about as long as we and our crewmates can handle it. Two weeks seems to be the point where you gently suggest somebody changes out their attire. Uh, we pack it in a bag, we put it in a cargo vehicle, and then we burn it up in the atmosphere. So all of our astronaut underwear is molecularly floating <laughs> above your heads. You think about that. This is not an extremely sustainable way uh, to deal with clothing. So long wear clothing, um, you know, ways to do microbial growth prevention so that we could extend our wear, ways to clean this clothing. Uh, we need abrasion prevention. We've got to deal with lunar dust, again, the flammability. Um, and waste recycling. And so I mentioned it earlier that we have power, mass, and volume issues. Um, and that's really what drove us for a lot of our experimental design, our equipment design in low Earth orbit. Um, we kind of treat waste as like, you know, you're going to send all this stuff off, off Earth. Uh, you're going to probably keep a lot of it on space station. So we have a lot of free volume in our spacecraft coming back down. So we can just dispose whatever we want to. And we pack our trash into these spacecraft, send it back to Earth, burn it up in the atmosphere. Um, we're not going to have that capability when we go to the lunar surface. Uh, we believe very strongly that humans have trashed this planet, and we should make every attempt to not trash extra, uh, uh, you know, solar bodies that are in our solar system. So there's a lot of thinking about what are we going to do with waste on the lunar surface? It's also, it's incredibly wasteful, right? I mean, we're, we're bringing up all this stuff. Everything that comes up to the space station is packed in huge amounts of foam. The scientists are worried about the vibration, which I understand, but you get your experiment out. It's like op opening your Amazon package. There's a tiny little thing in there. And there's a huge, huge amount of foam. You know, Amazon at least has solved this with these, these air cushions. We're sending all this foam up to the space station and we're throwing it away. Um, all of our food is double wrapped in plastic bags to help the shelf life. And we, we pull those apart and, and that creates a huge amount of volume of trash as all of our food wrappers. And so number one, uh, as we move further and further from the earth, mass is critical. Like everything that we bring with us 
is very expensive. It's orders of magnitude more expensive to launch something to the lunar surface than low Earth orbit. So there's no reason we need to be throwing things away. We don't want to be littering the solar system. And then we have this opportunity. Uh, as we get further from Earth, every carbon molecule is going to be important. Every nitrogen molecule is going to be important. So we need to figure out a way to build materials that we can then uh, in situ break down, recycle, uh, you know, make some make some substrate for your 3D printer, make some feedstock, um, and and figure out how we're going to reuse all of these materials, but retain their original properties, uh, which were you know protecting our food source from from radiation and and light uh, and degradation. So I'm starting to think about power mass volume waste. Uh, it's it's now it's now the four horsemen of launching things into space. And we need to start thinking about waste as a consumable. And so we are going beyond low Earth orbit. Uh, NASA has an incredible program. It's the Artemis program. Artemis is the twin sister to Apollo. Um, this, is, this is just what a time to be alive, right? Anybody that watched the moon landing, uh, we're doing this, we're doing it in a completely different way. Uh, we're doing this in a sustainable way. We want to not just go and come back. We want to sustain lunar presence. We want humans on the moon to be able to do incredible geology experiments. Um, there's a lot of really interesting physics experiments that we can do using the earth moon distance, uh, but we need to be able to stay for longer. We also are going to very different places. We're going to the pole, the South pole of the moon, which has these permanently shadowed regions where we're gonna find this water ice. It traps the volatiles. Uh, so the moon is, is this Rosetta stone of the last 4 billion years of our solar system. We can't observe these kinds of processes on there. All that geology that's that long ago, you know, has been subsumed and recycled and traveled all over the world in continents that have rearranged each other. Uh, so we, we have the moon as a place where that record of the solar system is preserved. Um, so we, we have ventured, this is not, for once, this is not a PowerPoint rendering. This is an actual photo of the Orion spacecraft. Uh, and it's, for, it's further out from the moon. You can see the moon and then you can see the earth beyond it. This is Artemis one. Uh, it did not have any people on it, but that was our incredibly su successful uh, first lunar demonstration mission. Uh, and four of my friends are gonna be launching on Artemis two at the end of next year. They're gonna do an Apollo eight style around the moon uh, and really prove out that this spacecraft is certified for use in humans. The next mission after that is Artemis three. We're gonna land on the surface of the moon. Um, so this is coming up and it's coming up quickly. We've got a lot of challenges and problems to solve. I wanna talk about spacesuits a little bit because it's my other favorite topic besides virology. Um, but on, on you know, the space station, we're really dealing with this microgravity suit. We've got a lot of challenges there, but our suits are 40 years old. Uh, and we really need to have a new suit for lunar exploration. Number one, we need a suit that fits everybody. Our 40-year-old suits only fit tall men. So <laughs> now that our program has become a little bit more diverse, uh, we need to be able to fit smaller men and we need to be able to fit women. And so it's really exciting to have the opportunity to design some more inclusive spacesuits. We got a lot of challenges that I talked about with the lunar surface um, and with this ambulatory suit. Uh, but we're also going to need to figure out um, how this suit, the material properties of suit, are interacting with the very samples that we are interested in working with. Um, so, the, you know, the, the picture on the left here is from our, our public relations folks, and I love it because there's no way any geologist is letting you pick up a rock with your hands and contaminate the outside of their sample before putting it in your purified sample bag. So that's a no-no, but it looks pretty. Uh, so we're, we're going to have a, a lot of really interesting research work, but a lot of challenges in the material space. And then eventually we're going to go to Mars. Um, this is, you know, this is, this is the point of the Moon to Mars program. All of these challenges I've talked about are going to be tenfold or a hundredfold more difficult when we go to Mars. But I'd like to bring it back to Earth to close. So all of this nanotechnology potential in space is incredibly exciting, but we are here on our home planet. And we have problems to solve back here. Uh, I was fortunate enough when I had my research lab at MIT that I was able to work with some physicians and scientists in the Democratic Republic of Congo at their National Institute for Biomedical Research. And we were looking at infectious disease, uh, monkeypox and Ebola outbreaks. And so as part of this, we're doing a lot of field work with a limited amount of equipment. And you would think that this kind of environment is just absolutely opposite to the shiny space station 
in low Earth orbit. And it's actually the most similar environment that I've found to space. Again, we got solar power, sketchy. Sometimes we got solar power. We don't have a lot of calm infrastructure. Um, we, we don't have access to clean water all the time. We have to purify all of our water. We got to bring all of our equipment with us. Um, and, and really my space MacGyver skills were honed uh, in the middle of the rainforest in Congo when the plane had dropped us off and said, we'll come get you in a couple months. So all of these challenges that we have in these remote areas are things that we are solving in NASA. But as I've been thinking about this and, and working on these problems for years now, I really have identified that the way we design things in the US is just assuming a power supply. We're assuming data infrastructure. We're assuming a large lab that has all of these capabilities. However, if we design things like that miniature sequencer that you can put in your pocket, that has opened up a world of possibilities for sequencing. Uh, a researcher can take that and they can go look in Columbia at the biodiversity of the forest. We're able to send this out to high schools and elementary schools so they can do sequencing. That kind of equipment would have been incredible. I, I was doing this work before we had um, the opportunity to uh, do nanopore sequencing. And so a lot of these things that I talked about, a lot of these challenges, um, solving them are, are going to really directly have impacts uh, on the developing world. And so I encourage you, you know, some of our equipment, it's just way too big. You're not going to miniaturize it. You need that giant power supply. But there are some types of equipment that you could miniaturize and ruggedize. And then there's materials that come out of these uh, large things that we need to think about, you know, how are we going to get those materials to places and transport them and use them in a really cost-efficient manner? Because if you make it small, we are very creative animals and we're gonna come up with ways to use this, uh, but you have to detach it from our very infrastructure heavy Western way of thinking. And so with that, I'd like to thank uh, the huge team that's been involved in the biomolecular sequencer. Um, and I'm happy to take any questions. Uh, so we have one question came in already. I think people were so engaged in listening to you. <laughs> they were a little slow to engage with the Slido. But um, so one of the questions is, is Artemis II ready to go technology-wise? That's a great question. Um, Artemis I had some issues that, you know, a few big issues that we're still working on. The biggest one was the heat shield. Um, and so uh, we designed this heat shield and it's essentially, it's, a, it's an ablative material. It's got this, you know, a little bit of a foam-like structure. And during the manufacturing process, um, there were some pieces of slightly lower density foam that, that got put in there and it was certified to be okay. Uh, and then we're coming back in with this heat shield and we're actually gonna do a skip re-entry on purpose. Uh, we wanna skip off the earth's atmosphere and then come back in because that slows down our energy tra trajectory and allows us to precisely target a landing site right off the coast of California. Um, and so we, we did this and actually it was incredibly fortunate. We thought the low density uh, material was gonna cause us a problem because there wasn't as much material to ablate off, but the fact that it had uh, more air pockets in it um, actually led to less of this phenomenon that we're seeing big chunks of char come off the heat shield. Uh, so the heat shield was designed to be ablative, um, but we did not model and we did not expect larger chunks of char to come off. And so a lot of thinking is, you know, maybe this is the skip reentry. We've heated up, we've cooled it a little bit. Now we're, we're coming in and we're heating back up. Uh, we, we don't fully understand the process. There's a huge amount of work going into this right now, um, but ways to uh, either mitigate this through changes in our trajectory, um, you know, new materials for this. We already have the Artemis II heat shield built, so we are probably going to use that. Um, but are, is there anything that we can do um, in that sense? And, and how are we going to deal with this heat shield issue going forward? Um, we have a few other issues uh, with um, some sensors uh, being accidentally exposed to some overvoltage conditions. I really wouldn't want to be that guy um, who has caused the... Uh, the sensor equipment in our life support system to have to go get a nice little wire harness on everything because we don't trust the power supply. But we're working through those. And, and uh, we recently slipped the deadline a little bit and we slipped it to the end of 2025. And that is a pretty realistic deadline. That's gonna, uh, we don't wanna keep slipping this deadline. Congress gets upset when you do that. Uh, people get upset. 
So we gave ourselves enough time, we think, to really resolve these problems uh, and to fly. And we're, we're not going to fly until we're ready. But all of the work that we did on Artemis 1, it, it's been incredible to see what that rocket did and how well it performed on the test flight. Um, things just do not usually go that well in a test flight, but it's an incredibly well-designed system. Thank you. And we have another question. Um, we know that NASA develops impressive technologies, but what is the technology that has surprised you when using it, either on the ISS or in preparation on Earth? That surprised me when I'm using it. Um, you know, I think a lot of the, the material science work has just been so incredibly impressive. And it may be because I'm not a material scientist, um, but with the lack of buoyancy driven convection, you can do really interesting thing with materials mixing. It's hard to pick one, right? I mean, we can do uh, electrostatic and electromagnetic levitation um, to be able to look at uh, heavier metal oxides than we could really keep suspended on Earth. Um, it, this is not an experiment that I get to see, but uh, there's an incredible physics experiment, the Cold Atom Lab, um, that's allowing us uh, to have longer flight times uh, in Bose-Einstein condensates and really integrate that data over much longer periods of time than we have on Earth. And so I, I, I think it's probably anything that I encounter as a scientist on board the International Space Station. Every experiment that I'm working with, it's pretty mind-blowing. Okay, I think this is this is a really good question, and hopefully, there's there's answers to this. But um, someone asked, "Is there any place when the where the public can share ideas, engage, and engage in other ways to propose solutions to the challenges you have mentioned in space or in other countries?" So, yeah. does NASA have challenges? Yes, NASA has challenges. Um, so, you know, NASA.gov is a great launching pad for all of that. Um, there's places actually, if you're an educator, that you can go, and NASA has a lot of materials either for classrooms or for parents at home that want to do, uh, you know, anywhere from K-12 education. Um, there's challenges that NASA puts out. We've got an open innovation initiative that NASA is really spearheaded, and so these challenges sometimes they're internal NASA challenges. Um, they will go external, where somebody says, "Hey, I've got this question. I'm just going to crowdsource it," and so the public can give us their thoughts and their opinions, and we're going to take those suggestions and review them. Uh, and we've had some some really incredible things come through that. Um, there are, uh, you know, if you look at any of the NASA broad agency announcements, there's challenges that are put out there. Um, and because we're a federal agency, everything that we do, you know, we, we start to publish stuff, it's it's subject to public comment. And so you can always look at, uh, we're, we're publishing things, and, and the whole point is to get that out in the public and actually to take public comment. So you can feed those comments back in, and we take those comments incredibly seriously, as every federal agency does, and we've got to respond to those. Um, and so that's, you know, sometimes it's a way for you as a citizen to say, I don't like that, we just fix the regulation. But you can also contribute ideas through that. And when we started thinking about um, what are scientific objectives, the fundamental things that are driving our requirement in Moon to Mars, uh, and we started putting the requirements together for the Gateway Space Station, I actually went in as a member of the public, commented on the NASA website about the lack of physics experiments on Gateway. I thought, you know, this is this incredible opportunity in near rectilinear halo orbit. We're going to be going really far from everything else. You know, we could have free flyers next to the space station. Uh, we could have a lot of, of physics experiments there. And um, the, you know, I don't know if it was my name or if it was just the fact that, uh, you know, we, we had this, this public comment, um, but the, the lead of the human exploration Directorate up at headquarters wrote me an email back and said, you know, thank you for this and we're going to look into it. So I really encourage the public to engage with NASA. We, we are excited about this and, and we're willing to take comments. And as, as scientists, researchers, and engineers, you know, be looking for NASA funding, either targeted funding or those broad agency announcements and submit proposals to us. I think we'll take one more question if that's okay with you, because I kind of like the how poetic this question is. If it took a molecular biologist to test pipetting in space, what artist type should go to test materials? A chef, a fashion designer, a painter, and why? And we'll, we'll close that close on that one because I think it's really- Yeah, that's, it's a really good point. Um, by bringing people who have specialization, uh, you can get a lot of input and ways of think, seeing things and designing experiments that you wouldn't normally have. So these experiments on earth, of course, have 
the brightest minds as subject matter experts. But something that we've been thinking about at NASA for a while, uh, we used to have this concept of, um, you know, a payload scientist that would fly on shuttle. So could we do some shorter duration flights? Could we purchase flights on private missions? Could we send a scientist or an engineer or researcher up there for 10 or 30 days um, to do their experiment and bring their equipment up with them? Uh, I've suggested that we pair that person with a, with a scientist or engineering astronaut and that astronaut actually go work in the person's lab for some time so that when the, um, when the short-term space flyer leaves, that astronaut can, can continue that work. And so this is something that we've been thinking about for a while. Um, and then we also have a lot more commercial participation in spaceflight. And when this first started, I have to say, I was, I was not excited. I was like, oh my God, the billionaires, like, you know, really the billionaires, but billionaires are going to billionaire, right? They're going to do it. They could be spending their money on another yacht that is polluting the planet, or they could be spending their money on space exploration, which is actually uh, another way it stretches the taxpayer dollars further and there and we're supporting a lot of this R&D and the space the commercial space that we have had so far yes there are billionaires they have been incredibly interested in science and they've been partnering with research institutions to bring work up with them we're able to bring scientists from other countries um, and so I, I think as part of this program we're going to start to expand this beyond um, just the the scientists and the engineers and certainly you know artists and fashion designers and chefs uh, and, and people who can communicate what it's like to be in the power and the majesty of being in low Earth orbit or seeing your home planet. Scientists and engineers are not really good at that. We're going to come back and we're going to give you a description of, you know, the luminescence of Earth is at this scale and it was really important to see it. I'd like, an, I'd like a poet to be able to describe that. And so I'm hoping with the commercial space, we're going to have more commercial uh, stations that we're going to send people um, that have have this wonderful creative way of looking at things. I think that will really add to our space exploration initiatives. 